Hello, everyone. We have Aristo, and he and I have been sitting here talking for a while before we even began the recording. Uh, but I'm going to let him take it away. He came up with a title, and it's a question. What do we do? Hello, Ron, and hello, everybody. Yes, we are here. We are talking. We have talked, and uh, it was a very animated conversation. Um, somebody who isn't from the Mediterranean might even say it was argumentative. But over here in Greece, we talk, you know, we always talk animatedly. We, we talk like we argue, but it's really just the passion of, of the discussion. So essentially, it all boils down to that. What Ron and I were talking about is, okay, you know, Ron, like me and everybody else, wants changes now, positive changes now. We want paradise now. This is almost like a child wanting it now. So, but I didn't say, what do we do now? You know, what do we do, period? I mean, now, yesterday, tomorrow, you know, it's, it's the question of what can I do, but what can we do as well, generally speaking? Um, it starts with what can I do? And the problem is that if we really understand this question, what can I do, what can we do, then we can understand our feelings around this question how we judge this question, how we evaluate this question, this whole sense, because just do it. Look at all the commercials. And these are commercials, or just do it. And, and most of them are American commercials because in you know, other cultures, you don't just go out and do it. Uh, you, you, you ponder it, you learn it, you design it. You, you know, there's a lot of things that, that go behind just doing, even in, in, in truth in, in American culture as well. There's a lot of preparation. Preparation, 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 you know, that's the secret. But to the unwary masses that have been conditioned by, in, in a way that they, we often have not realized that we've been conditioned, you know, the just do it, the impatience, the antsiness, you know, and then something comes up. So we go ahead of ourselves. We, we latch on to the, the biggest hope that comes our way, the first hope. Like a, like a desperate lover being jilted, then going for the first rebound effect that comes their way, and then getting jilted again, and then again, and again. And then what? So you're so jilted, you're just pissed off, you can't think clearly, and then you just grab a gun and start shooting people. You know, or I don't know, especially if you're on meds. So this... Oh, I, I don't do meds, y'all. You know. People that listen well, know that. Exactly. But you do do smart meters. And uh, uh, like I don't do that. that. <laughs> I didn't have a smart meter in my house. I was the only one in the neighborhood that did not allow the smart meter. Yeah. But circumstances, let's say in an esoteric sense, closed the space around you, the probability space where your options became less all of a sudden. Your energy was drained. You've been attacked. Anybody who, who is more esoteric inclined might say, or occult inclined might say, you've been cursed, you've been attacked. You were a focus of constant attacks. They were external and internal. You know, you were never a celebrity per se. It's not like you had millions of followers or thousands of followers, you know, 5,000 or whatever, or even 10,000. But your profile, in my honest opinion, is such that you collect, you could easily become a celebrity. You could easily have collected a lot of followers. So measures were taken that this did not happen. They do not want people. Uh, to be centers of inspiration. So now, you, and, and that's what you wanted in your life. You, you know, from what you said, and from what I understood, you wanted to be a, a, a divinely inspired center of inspiration to others. Uh, you know, to usher the new age, to open the gates, to play, to play a role along with the others, not uh, solitary. Yeah, not you. Yeah, not just you, but still. To be in a, in a key position to be able to inspire others because it's not like, well, you're going to do everything and everybody's just going to watch you and admire you. You know, that's the whole point of a leader or a celebrity persona is to be a point of focus. The leader actually has ideas about what to do and does things, but they represent the people that, that so-called follow. But a, a, a celebrity type is more a symbol and actually inspires by their mere presence and expression. In any case, you know, you did have the profile. Your prayers were answered in the sense, but everybody is tested in this world. We are all, and this isn't the test in the conventional sense, you know, in my honest opinion. So I wouldn't say, I'm using very simple words here. 
Um, we are tested in the sense that if you want to overcome a mountain, if you don't know how to climb mountains, you're going to fall down and kill yourself. You know, that's it. So the mountain tests you. You gauge yourself against your first attempt at climbing that mountain, and then you evaluate and say, shit, I wasn't ready to climb that mountain. I need to learn mountain climbing. I need to start from those, those rock climbing things, for example, or I need to go hiking. I need to get in shape. You know, all of well, That's these what happened when I was able to finally go to the gym and everything. I mean, when I first started out, I mean, I was very low on the scale of weights and everything else, and I built my body up fairly well, you know, over the really? past year. Oh, yeah. I'm, and that's something you never used to do. I no, mean, I, I never used to take time to exercise. No, no, no. In fact, you were living a very unhealthy life in the sense that you were on the computer too long, sitting down in one position, sleeping almost nothing at all, uh, and, you know, basically being sedentary. Now you're moving. Now you're more, even, even if you're getting a dose of smart meter, you're still outside a lot. You know, you're still out in the way. You know. I still spend a lot of time in, in my room, and when I'm not sitting in front of the computer, I'm laying on the bed listening to the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at anyway. least in that sense, you're relaxing, and then you're working out. Working out is, is, is a big deal. It's a change. You're exercising your heart. You need to do that. And your diet might be even better than it was. I don't know how that works. My diet's... It's not as extreme as it was when I thought I was going to become a vegetarian. Uh, ah, I see. Still have a cake, you know, meat on occasion, and I don't watch things as as I was instructed to do uh, as closely. But I, I try to have some balance in there, some equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're slowly recovering, but again, you've been dealt a big ass blow. People don't get those. If they, if most people get one kind of blow like that in their lives, and then take the rest of their lives to recover from it. But even if they do recover, they're still marked by it. I mean, and it, and and then that in the ideal case, that turns into wisdom. You become much wiser than before. You've been tested. So once you've been tested and you understand what's going on, you learn to climb the mountain. You know, it doesn't mean that you're going to automatically find the elevator to get you to the top. It's still going to be an ordeal because it's a mountain. There's gravity involved. There's snow involved. There's this rarefied air involved. But you want to get to that peak. Now, why can't we just have the hand of God come down and take us and bring us to the peak? Well, the hand of God did that. It gave us legs. It gave us arms. It gave us a head. So we can go through the process. The process is an adventure. Adventure doesn't mean having a good time. It means venturing outward. Venturing. It means doing it ourselves. Just do it? No. There's no just about doing it. Action is a sacred thing when it is honest and sincere. You know, one of the only reasons I ever took the OPPT thing seriously because it had a slogan, being and doing. And basically, those are two sides of the same coin. If you just are statically, then you really are not. You, you degrade. You really, you know, your, your existence uh, becomes less and less and less. Your experience becomes less and less. Even if you're not physically moving, you are still acting as a consciousness. You're still feeling. You're still moving through in some way. This doesn't mean going out and pounding nails or pounding the pavement. This means not stagnating. This means being dynamic in some way, even if it just involves your feelings or your thoughts. That way you get feedback because it's all about feedback. All life is feedback. All life is a cycle. The Ouroboros, the serpent biting its tail, all of these esoteric symbols, you know, they're universal in a sense. And you can't just apply, oh, what, what does this Ouroboros thing mean? Oh, it just means that, but not this. No, it means anything that it inspires you to me. That's the whole point of it. That's why they call it an archetype. So in any case, what do we do? Well, this is a question that doesn't need to be answered because it is a process question. Because when you are connected with your own being, you have challenges. Something restricts you. You always have desires. You want change in the world. Specifically, you want change in your life. You want to have your own place. You want to have your own freedom of movement. You want to have relationships that are ideal for you. 
all of these things and you feel inhibited. So before we go... I want to have access to some of my stuff that's buried in the storeroom somewhere. And I don't give it to you. Because I didn't even pack it in most cases. I had other people packing my stuff and helping me get as much out as I could. And I mean, I'm supposed to speak on a subject the end of next month in September. And uh, it refers to the book about Anastasia. They want me to talk about Anastasia. I don't know where any of my Anastasia books are. They're buried somewhere in my storage unit. And I have no clue. Where the storage unit is or anything? Oh, I know where the storage unit is, but I, you know, it's... Well, it's, it's a challenge. See, it is, I know, but that's a challenge. I mean, you know, I knew somebody who made a big move and they would spend like, what, $400 a month on a storage unit? And just, there was too much trouble and it was in another country and they thought all these things would happen in their lives and they didn't. So the money kept piling up and their, their, their bank account just get less and less just for that storage unit until they finally went off and, and just ended up giving everything away. Cause life brought them into a position where, you know, well, all of your possessions right now, you're making a change. The possessions you had in your old life are not compatible with your attitude in the new life. They all have energy and are tainted with a bias. Maybe you could purify it or whatever. It doesn't mean you're going to lose everything, but normally people don't do that. They have expectations. They take things for granted. They listen to promises. They feel betrayed. But then when they're wiser, they don't have to be suspicious and cynical. They just need to be discerning. It is the hardest thing to learn in the world because it's not a mental thing only. It's not a emotional thing only and it's not a physical sensate gut thing only it's a unification to be discerning we need to integrate ourselves to integrate ourselves we need to want to be discerning it needs to be a priority so life then how do i do this look at you you just described to me something that you can do but that's really hard it's not impossible it's not even improbable because you know where the storage unit is but you know it's highly inconvenient and it's a great challenge. It may be like climbing a mountain, but your desire to find those books that are valuable to you creates an energy when you move and take action to fulfill it. This starts a ball rolling in your life where your desire translates into action, translates into response, translates into challenge, translates into overcoming the challenge. That is a pattern. That pattern then has a tendency to repeat because you have more desires. The same thing starts. Once you get yourself moving into that frame of something you can do, well, what can I do? Well, I can't answer that. The thing is, everybody has something they wish they could do. It's too much trouble. I don't want to deal with it. And sometimes it's good not to deal with it. Sometimes we need the discernment to know when the right time to deal with it is, or if there is even a right time, because it may be something that's you know, it has nothing to do with it. We're, we're, we're done with that. I'm done with that. Forget it. You just easily say, take everything. Some people give you the advice. Forget about your possessions. Just, you know, start fresh with nothing. That's your choice, though. The thing is, every choice has ramifications. Each of these ramifications are an opportunity to build something. Once you start building something new, it becomes a new structure in your life. It becomes your base of operations. A foundation upon the foundation you build something the Bible with Peter you know I am the rock upon this rock build the church this was a person this this person had an attitude a certain framework upon this framework you could build a collective something or other so it starts with an attitude it starts with a decision not just one choice just do it you know sometimes we get ahead if we just do it then we just force ourselves through something we're not really participating The fact is, every second that we're doing something in a participatory manner, we're being and doing our our one, then that action has impact. Even if that impact is too subtle to affect anybody else, it doesn't have to be. If you started doing actions that would affect people right now, it would be too premature. And yet you are doing actions that affect other people. You are going out and speaking. Uh, I used to when I, I keep started, doing my videos every day, and believe me, there's days that I don't feel like it. Well, you shorten the video. Even if I got a number of ideas, I still there's. Yeah, yeah. You know, I thought, yeah. why am I still doing this? I'm not. I my numbers have dwindled, and I'm not getting the response I used to get. No, no. 
You, but the response reflects you. You have a different attitude than you did. I'm not criticizing that attitude. It's your right attitude for you. But people are difficult. You know, that's the thing. Do you want an audience that's entertained by you? Or do you want people to really engage with you? Engaging with you, honestly, is ugly. People are ugly. It's not a bad thing because we're all hurt. The world is ugly, not because it's a terrible, stupid place or, or criticized, but because it's hurt. It needs to heal. Somebody who's yeah, been I know there's a lot of people that want to start arguments, including my son. And I just don't want to argue with people. Present your viewpoint, fine. But don't try to engage me in an argument. I don't want to put my energy into that kind of, uh, of encounter. Exactly. I mean, and I, I feel the same way. I'm animated in my expression, but there's nothing to really prove. Look, man, it's like there's a lot of people, and, and that's one of the things I needed to overcome because when somebody has a strong viewpoint, it comes off as an argument, and sometimes it is. And if you engage with them, you try to, 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 to wrestle that viewpoint down, wrestle it because it seems to just bowl you over energetically. And it's like, well, that means I'm not standing firmly where I am. And I don't mean to be stubborn. You don't have to be stubborn. But the thing is, you don't even have, if you want to, for example, say, okay, I'm not sure about this. Step back, and then you lose your ground a little bit. You're flimsy. If somebody says, but I am sure, and starts boiling, you know, if I'm not sure about the existence of God, then some atheist comes along and starts slapping you down with arguments, or some religious fanatic comes along and starts slapping you down with arguments, your uncertainty is turned against you. And then you don't want to be uncertain to, again because you're attacked. You feel attacked. So, but that doesn't mean necessarily that you are attacked. However, if I am someone who wants to communicate people and to somehow inspire or convey, then I need to take into account that I'm walking a razor's edge. My doing, for example, might be my talking. Not just here, but in other media or my desire to talk, just like yours at this point. But I need to understand and learn from it that I'm walking a razor's edge. I cannot come off as holier than thou, you know. But I can also not come off as, oh, I'm humble, I'm such a, oh, yes, and what. And then at the same time, I need to understand, people don't like flaws. I can't go around telling people, you know, that I'm a flawed person in any specific sense. You know, maybe I got bad habits or something that are disgusting. Everybody might have one or two of those, you know. Um, maybe, you know, I might have bad, I'm not saying that I do, but just something, I'm even having a hard time picking up an example because we live in such politically correct times <laughs> that if I pick something that's acceptable, people will say, oh, you shouldn't be worried about, about that. But if I pick something that's even a, of the nature of a sexual deviancy or even comes close to it, oh my God, is Aristo, you know, a sexual deviant or something? Just look at again to, to do an example. What's his name? Don Ferguson, uh, the guy who basically used the name Zen Gardner. And uh, that now, not really allegations, but people have come out that he was in a cult and he admitted it in this uh, heavenly gate or something. And those people were known to be pedophiles and MK Ultra and I don't know what else, you know, at least the pedophile stuff. And, and so it's pretty serious. On the other hand, when you see the others attacking him, I get a whiff of opportunism, you know, because the per one person attacking him promotes his own agenda all of a sudden. The new age is this, and here's my view that I'm now, and check out my book, and check out my seminar, and check out, you know. So it, it's a free-for-all. And people are saying, no, this is not a witch hunt. I'm, I'm you know, compassionate. I really care. It's like, well, that's what the people who hunted the witches said. You know, they were all holy people. They were all priests. They were all just out looking for the souls of the witches, you know. And at the same time, some of these witches may have been cursing people, maybe half of them. I don't know. But a lot of them were turned in by the real witches or the real sorcerers. A lot of the priests were actually doing the black magic, you know, and the pedophilia and all of this stuff. So we're being played. Of course, this, this guy may be whatever. I don't know. But that's beside the point at this point. Because when we go, what do I do? We also need to know, am I acting or am I reacting? And not judge ourselves too harshly for reacting because sometimes you need to just keep reacting until the feedback gets tiresome and you get to see exactly how you're being played. 
even if it's a just reaction or an allegedly just reaction. You know, some of the biggest supporters of Zen Gardner are the same people that are attacking you. Now, what are they going to do? Are they going to start attacking him? You know, I don't know. I don't participate in those discussions. <laughs> you know, I don't want to. And that doesn't make me uncaring because there are pedophiles that are a lot worse than that. You know, you go around and say, okay, we attack people because what? We want to knock somebody down so we have a satisfaction that we're doing something while the other people control the game, you know, the whole thing and are playing us off of each other, you know. There's always going to be all of this stuff unless, until the core issues are resolved, until society changes. But the change isn't going to happen by pressing buttons. It also isn't going to be guaranteed if you take a few people and incarcerate them because the system of incarceration is, is owned by these people. They've created it. How can you? And it's the people that do the incarcerating of others that are the ones that most are in need of being incarcerated for a exactly, time. Exactly, exactly. As it's I a, see it. <laughs> yes, but it's a form of slave trade. So how are you going to enslave the slave trader? You're still in, engaging in the, in the thing. Something else is needed maybe or a modification. Oh, but what? Well, of course you're going to ask that question because you've been brainwashed with a limited set of solutions. Anarchy may not be the, the well, then some people say, well, we just need to just forget about uh, authority completely, anarchy, whatever. And it's like, well, and maybe we can discuss get together, have a round table discussion. These things don't work that way when you have the undercurrents of our psyche are, are completely diseased at this point. And they're diseased partly because we're in denial and we're afraid of our dark side. We keep talking about the shadow, the shadow. Yeah, well, here, here's the shadow, you know. The whole pedophile thing is the shadow and everybody's terrified that they might be one. Everybody's terrified that they might be a racist unless they're, they're part of a minority who's been convinced that they're the victims. And, then, and have been the victims. But everybody is like this. What did Jesus say about it? Who cast the first stone? You know, you know, kill the sinner, kill the prostitute, kill the whatever, you know, cast the first stone. But any stone you cast is going to fall on you in the end because, this, and this includes the psychopaths. It's just that they think they control the game. But as soon as we stop playing it in the sense of our reactions, as soon as our reactions start becoming actions, and it doesn't matter what they are. That's what I'm saying. I mean, don't try to move and do something profound. You don't have to. Do small things, but just make sure they're actions. Even if you want to go off the grid for a while, just know that there's not going to be any off the grid anymore. That's temporary. Anything you do that makes you think you can escape the system is temporary. And going off and saying, well, forget it, you know, it's all going to go to hell anyways. Well, then it will for you. That will be a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, because you don't care, then nobody's going to care about you. Maybe nobody ever cared, but have you really, really cared about you? I'm not talking about complaining and wanting help and wanting this and crying out, but I mean, okay, a lot of people don't know that they hate themselves. They don't know that they need to forgive themselves. And this is not a new age cliche. Forgiveness is not a word. It's an attitude. It's ongoing. It never stops. It's knowing you are flawed and being fine with it because you're moving. You're not stagnant. Flaws are not bad. The best beauty, the Japanese say, comes in something that is perfect but has a few flaws. So you minimize your flaws. But if you try to eliminate them, you're not human anymore. And you're not even divine. This is why I don't believe the divine is perfect as we conceive perfect. This is why I believe the divine, if it isn't flawed, it's not growing. And if it's not growing, then it can't manifest, it can't create, because it has nothing to do with process. In order to create something, you need to be able to embody it, you need to be it. Like we, human beings, create a camera because we have eyes. If we didn't have eyes, we wouldn't be able to invent a camera. If some it wasn't part of our experience, part of our being, part of who we are. If the divine wasn't part, for example, if everything that is good in our world wasn't part of the divine already, it wouldn't exist. If everything that is bad in our world wasn't a potential within the divine, it wouldn't exist. Because anything good can become bad, anything bad can become good. And that's not a bad thing because it gives us options of creativity because sometimes there's a gray area between the good and the bad that's not really gray. 
it's a rainbow of possibilities where you can find a whole new level of good or, or, or you know, wonderful even, or even beyond where, where if you can take the paradox and say, oh, this looks bad, but actually if I shift it this way and add some love in it and do a little bit of this to it, it's not bad. Can I give you examples? No, I'm going to ask you to, well, see if you can find examples. See if you can ponder it and find examples. Because anything I say is an example, either the mind is going to try to argue it with it, or it's going to stay, oh, how wonderful, and leave it at that. This is inner work. This is a simple, simple, simple form of inner work, to be able to engage with yourself, to engage with your own inner dialogue without condemning yourself. So uh, are we... Oh, no, I'm just typing uh, inner work. It's the first I've typed or made any note. Okay. Saying. You have seven minutes left. Okay, sure. <laughs> but in any case, I'm trying to say that, look, people get disappointed because they expect things to be easy. The word easy and difficult undermines, underestimates, doesn't even come close to the crappy experiences that we have trying to get by, trying to move ahead, trying to do. But the thing is, you don't need to become a cynic permanently but you need to allow yourself to be, go through the moves that you go through. Say, okay, I feel like shit today. And I, I feel like, I mean, I go on Facebook personally, I, I feel like really, you know, burning the whole thing to the ground, if I could. I go through phases of what is this? What are these people? Who are these people? What are they posting here? You know, and again, I'm speaking generally. If I spoke specifically, you'd have a lot of angry people out there commenting on this video. But I'm sure there are others, and I've heard comments from others, where you just need to step back. There's other people I, I have respected in the past for the viewpoints that just post complete, you know, and maybe because stress makes you want to do this. Or maybe because I'm interested in people's viewpoints, but I don't give a damn about their personal life. You know, I don't need to see that, you know, really. Well, then don't see that. Well, it's staring me in the face, you know. But I can't say it's offensive. You know, but it is offensive, and that's fine. I mean, I'm not one of those people who's bothered when something is offensive, you know, to the point of trying to stop it, unless it, be, it becomes hurtful. That's different. But on the other end of the spectrum, you know, I need to have the option to turn it off. And we all need to search for options of when something is becoming offensive before we launch a crusade against it or vent against it. You know, let's just turn it off, step back, and okay, I really do not choose to go in that direction. I do not choose to deal with that issue. Thank goodness if it is an issue that needs to be addressed, there are enough people today, there's so much of a variety that anybody can have an issue. You cannot have all the issues. You can't deal with them all. You can't even deal with half of them or even 10%. Just pick your thing, not a crusade, but just pick what's important to you and say, okay, within this domain, you know, but at the same time, when you're dealing with yourself, you need to have your field of vision open. You need to be observant in your life, your relationships, your patterns, your feelings, everything. Do not take things for granted. I've been saying this in many, many videos, again, as a suggestion, as a nice, calm suggestion. And you can learn in this way to discern because discernment, being and doing, here's my final statement. In other words, let's just wrap it up and say this. Being and doing are bonded by the glue of discernment. Okay? So if your discernment is strong or being cultivated, even if it is weak now, if your actions and your intentions, because all actions and all being, again, stem from intentions. They stem from desires. Desire is based on feeling. Intention is based on mind and consciousness. They are two sides of the same coin. But discernment is what bonds everything, just as love is what bonds everything. So discernment and love are also close together. Discernment is not a cold and calculated thing. So please think on these things. This is more than food for thought. This is actual nourishment that can lead you to basic action. Just like Ron might decide one day to go to the storeroom and, and see what's his, to get in touch with his past. Each of these items might hold a memory. They might hold something that, that was slipped by you. That They might hold an empowerment. Who was the Ron before the heart attack, before the betrayals, before the disappointments, etc.? You know, maybe those lost parts of yourself, they're not lost. They're just in storage. 
when you're ready to pick up on them, you can go and touch base. Maybe all of us have that. So what do we do? It's up to you. And on that note, I'm assuming you're closing. <laughs> I'm closing, yes, yes. So okay. we don't keep well, you didn't even off. use up to 33 minutes. Oh, really? What, what are we, like 31 points? Uh, <laughs> two and a half, just a little over two and a half minutes. Uh, okay. I cut a little bit of that off. <laughs> All right. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So thank you, Aristo. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the processing so that I can get on to my appointment later, a little bit yes, later. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ron. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste.